morning. Welcome to our morning worship. We come this morning to bring worship and praise to Almighty God. And if you're a visitor this morning with us, we just pray that you'll just know God's blessing as you meet with us this morning. Uh, this is Presbytery uh, Exchange Sunday, and the Reverend Brownlow is in the first garb this morning. And as a result, we're delighted to welcome uh, the Reverend Mark Donald, Minister of First Garva. Mark, it's a delight to have you with us. Uh, we look forward to what you have to share with us later in the service. And there are just a couple of announcements. Uh, Bible study on Wednesday evening in the church building here at 7.30 p.m. as we continue with the next installment in the Proximity series. And uh, if you have any prayer requests, please place a note in the uh, box in the vestibule as our prayer teams meet each Sunday after worship. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. It's a delight to be with you. What a lovely morning it is. But I suppose the sun shines here in Dermore every Sunday. But uh, it was lovely driving over the mountain, coming down to the Foyle Valley to arrive here in Dermore this morning. Uh, it's just great to be with you all. And I bring the greetings of your brothers and sisters in Christ in First Garva here today too. And it's just lovely to be in your meeting house to see it just looking so lovely and I was having a wee look over in your hall as well to see some of the refurbishments which you've been doing there which are great and to see the hall packed with children all at Sunday school as well so encouraging so a big thumbs up and a well done for me today we'll come here to worship God and I just read from his word and the Psalms and Psalm 100 and here we're told to shout for joy to the Lord all the earth worship the Lord with gladness Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to lift our eyes heavenwards now as we stand to sing our first hymn, which is, There is a Higher Throne. So we stand as we worship and praise God together.
wonderful singing from everybody. Uh, well done. Thank you, Sam, for a lovely welcome as well. Um, it's around eight years ago, actually, since I was last here in uh, Drummer Coles, because I was involved with uh, training your new elders back in. So they're not as new now, are they, eight years on? But I know that they're doing a fantastic job, and I remember it well because that's when my daughter Sarah was born uh, at that time too, so, so there we are. Anyway, we're going to come before God now in prayer. Yes, that's what we're going to do now, so let us pray. Almighty God and loving Heavenly Father, we come together in this place to proclaim your greatness and acclaim your glory. For you are Emmanuel, our God who is with us. You are the Prince of Peace, the Mighty One, the ever-living God. And we come to meet with you this morning and to bring the praise and the worship that you deserve. Everlasting God, the years go by, but you are unchanging. And in this fragile world, you are the only firm foundation. You are always loving, you are always true, always merciful, and always good. Yesterday, today, and forever, you are the same. You never change. And you give us the assurance that your will shall be done and your purpose shall finally triumph. And we thank you that in all the changing circumstances of the journey of life, you are constantly active. You are day by day are working to fulfill your sovereign purpose. So teach us your people to live each moment with total confidence, knowing that though all may else may fail, you will not. And forgive us, Lord, for the times we live our lives with you on the periphery. Instead of listening to your voice, we tell ourselves what we want to hear. Instead of seeking your will, we prefer our own, expecting you to conform to our expectations. Forgive us for all the ways, consciously and unconsciously, that we shut out our minds to your living and loving presence. Forgive us when the decisions we take contradict our faith and deny the gospel. And forgive us when we fail to love and forgive like Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, help us to turn our face towards the cross on Calvary. Take us back again to ponder the life you gave, the price you paid to save us. Father, we thank you for the cross where all our shame was laid. You gave yourself for us. You, the King, gave yourself for us, the sinner, offering your death and suffering. And with grace, you came to pay the ransom of our souls. From death, you brought us back into your mercy through the cross. Oh, Jesus, how could we ever be the same? For because of Calvary, we are to be changed forevermore. So, Lord Jesus Christ, when our faith is weak, strengthen it. When it is shallow, nurture it. When it is flawed, correct it, and when it is partial, complete it, and teach and nurture each one of us through your Spirit and by the grace of Christ, that we might bear fruit for you as we live lives of worship and service. So, Lord Jesus, through your Spirit, empower us to worship you with heart and soul, mind and strength, offering you all the praise and the glory. Draw near to us now in these few moments of quietness and teach us to be still and to know your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the name above all names, who taught his disciples to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, boys and girls, it would be great if you could come and join me at the front, and I will see you there. Come on ahead. Great. Oh, you're going to need a bigger front pew here, aren't you? You had to have to come into the second pew as well. Super. Great to see you all this morning. What have you got with you here? Here are they. What are these wee figures? Hmm? Sorry? They're lovely, aren't they? 
great to see you all. Right, boys and girls, I've got some things to show you here today. Let me see. I want you to tell me who would wear these things. Who would wear these things? Now, the first one is, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a reflective coat, a high-vis coat. You should see this at night when the light gets onto it, okay? I wonder who would wear a coat like this. Any guesses? What do you think? A ghost? Well, <laughs> I, I don't know what ghosts wear, right? Okay. Right. Okay, let me see what else I've got in here. Right. Um, I saw somebody wearing a pair of shorts. I should have had mine on today. But anyway, I've got a pair of shorts here with me. Who would want to wear a pair of shorts, you think? Yeah. Football people. Do you think I would play football? Do you think I would play football? Do you think I'd be good at football? Yeah. What team do you support? No, it's not football. I'm wicked football. Right. Okay. I've got a, a t shirt here now. Okay. What does that say? There's a clue in this t shirt. Yes. A runner. Yes, this is a park run t shirt. I believe there's one in Lima Valley, not far away, so you can go there on Saturday morning. Okay. There's one Garva Forest. A, a runner. Okay. And what else have we got here to show you? This is a big clue. A pair of trainers. Okay. And. Oh, would you see this here? It's a, it's a headlight and a taillight for a runner as well. What about that? You can go running at night and then people can see you. There we are. I'm talking about running. Who likes running? Does anybody do any running here? Yes, have you run any races ever? Have you? Maybe at school for sports day and that kind of thing. Let me tell you about a sports day that I was involved with as a boy, as a young fella at school, because that was... The sport in which I used to do was running, athletics, that kind of thing. That's what I was kind of good at. But anyway, of course, runners run to get what? What do you get at the end, maybe the race? You get some of these. What are they? Medals, okay. So this one is, uh, what color is this medal? Bronze medal. You get that if you're third. This is a silver medal. You get that if you're second. And this is the third medal, which is, is gold. And you get that when you are first. Well, I was running the 800 meters, which is twice round a big running track. And I was ahead. I was leading. I thought I was winning. And I could see the finishing line not very far ahead of me, maybe another 100 meters or so to go. And I was cruising to win. But I made a big mistake big mistake. And instead of getting the gold medal because of that mistake, I ended up getting a silver medal. Because you know why? Do you know what happened? I looked over my shoulder to see where your mom was who was coming behind me. And when I looked over the left shoulder to see where your mom was coming behind me, guess what happened? It came up this outside of me. And he won. I haven't got over it. I need to let it go, don't I? You know what I mean? It's about 30 years ago. <laughs> anyway, I need to let it go. Anyway, I looked behind. I took my eyes off the goal, the finishing line, and I didn't win. I became second, and I got the silver medal. Now, the next race, by the way, was at 1,500 meters. That's about four times around the track in a bit. And I didn't look back then. And I got the gold medal. But there you are. But I still remember that time, that 800 meters race, when I was about fourth or fifth form, fourth form. And it was a hard lesson to learn. Now, in the Bible, it talks about following Jesus, being a Christian, as being in a race. And you know, one of the hardest things about running or any kind of sport is, and I know for me, the hardest bit for me is putting this stuff on you know, because I can't really be bothered, and it can be hard, and it can be cold, and it can be wet, and it, it's not that easy. Starting and putting the kit on can be tough. And following Jesus, putting your faith and trust in Jesus can be difficult because you think, mm, it's going to be hard, you know. It's a long way to go, what will other people think? But, you know, once you get it on, once you start on the journey, it's good to be with Jesus. So I wonder, boys and girls, whether you've come to that starting line yet and you've stepped out to follow Jesus by putting your faith and trust in him, that's a wonderful place to be. Make sure you're on the race and on the journey with Jesus. 
But the second lesson is this, and this is what we learn, and we're going to be thinking about this later on in our service in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. The Apostle Paul tells us that we need to press on towards the goal. We're not to look back in any way. So when you're following Jesus, if you're following Jesus today, don't be distracted. Don't take your eyes off Jesus and look behind and look at other things and look at other people who might distract you and take you off the race. Keep your eyes fixed on him, will you? And the prize, well, it's even better than a gold medal. The prize is living in et for eternity with Jesus in heaven and what a place that will be. We've been singing about it earlier in our service. A place of gold and sapphire and emerald. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be amazing. It's beyond our imagination what heaven is like. And believe you me, it's better than any gold medal. So keep pressing on. Keep following Jesus, will you? Day by day. Okay. He's running by your side and he goes on ahead of you. And he'll be there at the finishing line for you. You keep running, okay? Every one of you, right? So we'll have a prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and most blessed God, we thank you for the journey of life. And you don't want us to journey and run that race by ourselves. You want us to run the race with Jesus. Help us to come to the starting line, putting our trust in him, and promising to follow him day by day. May nothing distract us from the race and the prize that lies ahead. May we never look back at the life we led. May we look always forwards with our eyes fixed upon Jesus and the wonderful goal of heaven and an eternity with him, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. May it be so for every one of these boys and girls today. We commit them to you, Lord. Ask that you would bless them, watch over them all of their days and help them on that journey of faith and the race with you. For the Savior's name we pray. Amen. Now, Claire, Claire, you're an amazing musician, pianist, and Chris have written a special verse for our children's hymn today, and it's all about what I've been thinking about, and the, and the great, so we're going to sing now, give me oil in my lamp, isn't that right, and then wait till you hear the special verse from which they've written too, and then you're heading out to children's church.
And we are going to worship God now as we come with him, to him with thanksgiving as our offering is received. Let's pray with thanksgiving. Dear Saviour, who gave your all at Calvary, help us to believe that when you ask us to worship you with our gifts, may it not be solely out of duty, but rather an exercise of our faith and a fitting response to the mercy and loving kindness you pour out upon us so faithfully, day upon day. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, please turn with me to our reading for today, which is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3. We've already been thinking about it with the boys and girls. And so we read today from Philippians, chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 12, pressing on towards a goal. And I hope to bring you a word of challenge and a word of encouragement today. Let us hear from God's precious truth. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers. And take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For... As I have often told you before, and I say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Amen. And thanks be to God for this reading of his precious truth. And we come before God again in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and most loving God, we come to pray for our world and your church. And as we gather in this your day, we pray for believers from all corners of the world who will profess and proclaim the name of Jesus. Also very different, yet united as one through faith in Jesus, your son. Lord, we know often we, your church, can get things wrong. Your people disagree, and this causes division and fraction. And we ask you to help us to be united to help your church to stand as one so that the gospel may be shared across the world all the more boldly. Teach us, Lord, how we can journey together, showing the world how we love one another. Lord, you ask for 
us to give you all that we owe, all that we are in service. And so we reflect upon ourselves this day, reflecting upon what we do for the kingdom. Oh, give us the courage to stand up and be counted, to go with the good news of the gospel into our homes, into our workplace, into our schools, into our community. Help us to love one another just as you love us. And Lord Jesus, we remember your followers throughout the world who are in prison today because of their love for you and their loyalty to the gospel. Help us to stand with our brothers and sisters as though physically present with them in their suffering. We pray that they will receive encouragement that through their faithful witness, the light of your truth would reach the darkest of places. And please enable Christians in prison to serve as ambassadors despite their chains to convey your message by their lives and by their words. Fortify them with the witness in their spirit that your word is never in chains. And gracious and most loving God, we pray for this congregation of Dermore this day. And we thank you for the blessings and encouragements that this congregation are experiencing. We thank you for the precious gift of children and young people and for the numbers at Sunday school, the numbers who gathered in the front pews this morning for the children's talk. They are the future of your church. They are the future of this congregation. Help us to invest in them, to invest in them in prayer, that they would know your loving grace and kindness, mercy, and most of all, salvation poured out upon their hearts. We claim them for you this day. We pray for all who serve within this congregation, and we especially remember the Reverend David and his wife Gillian and the Mance family. We pray that they would know your encouragement as they labor for you. We pray for those who support them in leadership, the Kirk Session, the committee, and all those who serve in whatever sphere of ministry within this family of God. We pray that you would come alongside them and walk with them and enable them and equip them for the task. And God of all peace, we pray for those countries in the world suffering from conflict, war and oppression and destruction. We know that so many lives are lost, families, communities, and countries torn apart. And we switch on our news and we just feel consumed by, by the terror and the worry and the rage. We can feel so helpless that sometimes it overwhelms us, or we feel so helpless that we become numb. Lord, we do not have the answers on how to fix this broken world. And as the conflict in Ukraine rages on, we just can't see an end to it all. So, Lord, we bring these situations to you, trusting in your promise and knowing that nothing is impossible for you. And we boldly ask for you to bring an end to all wars so all your people may live in peace. And God of healing, we pray for all those who are sick or suffering, either in mind, body, or spirit this day. And in the moment of silence, we will bring before you those who you have placed upon our hearts, those known only to you, who need a touch of your grace. <clears throat> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for those whom we have prayed for and make us instruments of your peace and love. Where there's hatred, let us so love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Merciful Father, accept these, our prayers, for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we again worship and praise God with the words of our next hymn, All I Once Held Dear. And this again reflects um, part of the passage from Philippians chapter 3.
And let us pray. Knowing you, Lord, knowing you, it is the greatest thing. And we pray, O oh God, as we reflect upon your word now, that we, be, we would learn more of you and know you better. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul must have been a sports fan. Maybe he was involved in sport himself. Maybe he was a runner. Who knows? I wonder what kind of uh, running shoes Paul would have worn. Maybe they were high-tech silver shadows back then. Who knows? Maybe he was into boxing, athletics. Because over and over again, many times in many places in his letters, Paul uses illustrations from sports to make his point. He speaks of wrestling. He speaks of boxing. He speaks of running. He speaks of winning the race, about winning the prize, and winning the crowns. He talks about the discipline necessary to win and the danger of being disqualified. We just don't know if he played sports himself, but it's clear that he was fully acquainted with the athletic world of the world he lived in. And when he wanted to sum up his life, he does so in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. And this is what he says about his life. He says, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. The first phrase comes from boxing. He's fought the fight. The second phrase comes from running. I have kept the race. Sport teaches valuable traits such as discipline, training, perseverance, teamwork, the value of high goals and aspirations, and learning how to keep victory and defeat in proper perspective. And in many ways, a Christian life is like that, isn't it? It's not enough just to start off with a bang. You've also got to finish well. And too many people enter the Christian life and they cross the starting line, perhaps with great enthusiasm, only to disappear into mediocrity along the way. So many Christians can lack purpose. So many believers can lack drive. So many people of faith can lack motivation in life and faith. And in the journey of life, and faith, it is easy for us to find ourselves perhaps treading water or going around in circles, getting on with everyday living, but with no overall direction. And it's the same with faith. And Jesus has noticed this with the people that he met. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, for instance, Jesus said that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Like sheep, they were wandering in circles or even in their own direction. And this is why Jesus calls us to follow him. He gives us a direction to follow him, to have a very clear sense of direction in life, to set out on a journey of faith with him. And you know, we have far too many amateur Christians who are a mile wide and an inch deep when it comes to faith. Following Jesus Christ is not a hobby like stamp collecting and you bring the album out every now and again to look at it. It demands a total. It demands a complete it demands a day and daily commitment of your life. Finishing the race, crossing the finishing line, and entering into glory ought to be the conscious and cherished goal of every believer and at the forefront of our thinking. How do you finish? How do you reach that finishing line? It's by running towards it. How do you obtain the goal? By laying hold of it with all of your might. How do you finish the race? By never giving up, never looking back. 
and always staying the course. There's no coasting. There's no lackadaisical lifestyle. There's no aimless wandering. There's no zoning out. Instead, there is careful discipline, passionate pursuit, and steady progress forward. So I want you to reflect upon your faith today as a believer, as a Christian. Are you coasting today? Could you describe your faith as perhaps being lackadaisical? Are you aimlessly wandering? Maybe even now during the sermon you're zoning out. No. There has to be careful discipline, passionate pursuit, and steady progress forward as a Christian. So let's look at what Paul says to us to urge us to strive and press on forward in faith with Jesus together. And the first thing we learn in our reading today is that we're to make God's goals our own goals. And we learn of that in verse 12. Before, uh, in verse 12, make God's goals your goals. Not that I have already obtained all this or have, have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And if these verses do nothing else, it reminds us of this. It reminds us that Paul wasn't the perfect package and none of us are either. It puts an end to all of this dreamless idea of sinless perfection that we can have in this life. None of us are the finished article. Paul tells us, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And Paul tells us, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. He's not there yet. It's likely that it's been 30 years since Paul became a Christian. And in that time, he'd won many spiritual battles. He's planted churches. He has grown significantly, significantly in his faith. But he, when he reflects upon his journey of faith, he says, I'm not perfect. And unlike so many contemporary leaders in business and politics today, Paul has no problem admitting his own personal shortcomings. Paul isn't the perfect Christian yet, and he knows it. And this becomes a place where his spiritual growth begins. Complacency does not belong in our faith. It's true that Paul rested completely in what Jesus had done for him at the cross. He trusted confidently that he had been made 100% righteous because of what Jesus has done for him at Calvary. And he rejoiced as he was acceptable in God's sight. But when it came to his everyday practice in Christ, he was not content with where he was at. He was not satisfied in his faith. He sought with great diligence to grow to be more and more like Jesus saved him to be. And I wonder if that is your desire today. None of us can be content with where we are as Christians. Our desire is to be more like Jesus day by day, that we are a work in progress. We're not the finished article, any of us, far from it. Sanctification, you see, becoming more like Jesus is a lifelong process for all believers. And like Paul, none of us can boast that we have obtained all that God wants us to do in our lives. For each of us have our own special place of service and witness. And each of us have our own personal goal that has been established by Christ to press on to obtain. So if Paul isn't there yet in terms of his faith, I imagine none of us are here. So we can't be found coasting. We can't be found cruising. We can't be found standing still as followers of Jesus. We need to be making God's goals our goals. And twice Paul says in our passage, I press on, meaning I'm not where I want to be, but I'm going to keep moving in that direction. And in the life of faith, following Jesus, direction makes all the difference. True believers aren't in heaven yet but they aim their very next step in that direction. And next Paul says, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And here probably at the forefront of Paul's mind was how he was taken hold by Jesus on the way to Damascus. Just a few verses earlier in verse 6, Paul talks about how he formerly was a persecutor of the church. 
Paul was talking about when he was on his way to further persecute the church in Damascus, that Jesus laid his hands on him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus took hold of him. And Paul, formerly Saul, was never the same after that point, was he? When Jesus took hold of his life, Paul was radically changed. He was chained as a slave of Christ to do the will of God in Christ as an apostle because Christ Jesus had made him his own. And I wonder if the Lord Jesus Christ has taken hold of you. Maybe it was a Damascus Road experience, a sudden grasp of you. Or maybe it was a slowly tightening grip along the journey. Has the Lord Jesus Christ taken hold of you? God has a purpose for your life. But in order to fill that purpose, you need to grab hold of that for which he grabbed hold of you. And you can only do that as you spend time with him in his word and in prayer. Grab hold to those moments of spending time with him. Walk close with God. Make his goals your goals. And he will lead you where you're supposed to go. And the second thing which I want to share with you today in this passage is that we need to keep a forward focus at all times. And we learn of that in verses 13 to 14. We need to keep a forward focus. Keep a forward focus at all times. You can't run very well looking backwards. You can't drive forwards looking in the rear view mirror. If you're going to press on towards the goal that God has for you, you need to keep a forward focus at all times. And so how do you do that? Well, Paul says in verse 13, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but the one thing, the one thing I do, and I'm sure Paul had many things going on in his life, and yet he was able to focus all of his energies in one direction and say, one thing, one thing I do. He got rid of the distractions and he kept his focus on Christ. There's a saying that says that you can't chase two rabbits. You will not catch either one. We can't serve two masters. God is first and he cannot be second. We all have the same number of hours in a day. So why do some people get so much more done than others? Well, they narrow their focus. Not everything on our to-do list is equal. We have to figure out what matters most. We have to say sometimes no to good things so that we can say yes to the best thing. And that one thing God has called us to do. Every day, we're told in Matthew 6, verse 33, Jesus tells us we're to seek first the one thing, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Just think of all the stuff. Just think of all of the excuses that we put in the way of the one thing that we should do, which is to acknowledge, worship, love, and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you do, the one thing, do it all for the glory of God. What is the one thing that you do that you need to stop doing, perhaps? What is the one thing that you are not doing that you should be doing? What is the one thing that, if you did it, would help you personally, spiritually, in your service of God, in your marriage, in your relationships, in your family, and your job? The one thing you should do is to keep a forward focus on Jesus. And then next Paul tells us that we need to forget what is behind and strain towards what is ahead. Look at the rest of verse 13. Paul says, but the one thing I do is what? Is forget what is behind and strain towards what is ahead. When you're in a race, the last thing that you want to do is to look back as I shared with the children. And in Vancouver, Vancouver in Canada, there's a bronze sculpture commemorating a race between John Landy and John ba Roger Bannister and it took place in the 1954 Commonwealth Games. And this, was, this race was known as the Miracle Mile because it was the first race in history where two runners had both run the mile in under four minutes. And Landy, he held the world record, and he was actually winning this race when he made that one crucial mistake. He looked back over his shoulder to check Bannister's position. And as he looked over his left shoulder, Bannister surged by him on the right, winning the race by 0.8 seconds. And this sculpture was sculpted from a photograph taken of that fateful moment. And after the sculpture was made, Landy commented on it, and he said this. 
is that while Lot's wife was turned to a pillar of salt for looking back, I am probably the only one ever turned to bronze for looking back. Do you ever look back in such a way that keeps you moving forward in your Christian faith? If you let past failures go to your head and your heart, what happens? You soon feel defeated. You feel like a failure. You feel unworthy to remain in the race. You feel like throwing in the towel. You feel defined by the past failures. That's the devil's work. He wants us to look back. He doesn't want us to look forward in Christ. And when we look back, we get demoralized, don't we? We take our eyes off the goal. Just think of the Paul, Apostle Paul's background. Think of his background and what he could look back to. He had blood in his hands, hadn't he? He was an accessory to persecution of Christians, the death of Christians, when he lived the old life of Saul. Remember, he looked after the coats of those who stoned Stephen to death. If the past failure was a real failure, a real sin, the beauty of God's grace is that he forgives your sin and remembers your sin no more. So why are you remembering it when he doesn't? If you're a Christian and you've confessed your sin and you've turned away from it, then it's forgiven, it's covered, it's cancelled, it's cast out into the sea of God's forgetfulness and it is gone forever. So we need to trust the Lord's grace, not only with our past sin, but also with our past disappointments and our past hurts and our past failures. Trust him knowing that he has promised to work out all things together for the good of his people. Trusting God frees you from living in a world of past pain and frees you to live fully in the present moment as a runner of Christ who's looking ahead to glory. If you keep looking backwards, you will never go forwards in faith. Christians, we need to forget what is behind and then strain towards what is ahead. And that word strain means to exert yourself to the uttermost. You know, there's effort. There's effort in the Christian life. You're saved by grace, yes. But that does not mean that there's no work for you and me to do. Faith is not a decision you made in the past that has no effect on your life today and tomorrow. Faith is something that you and I need to work out each and every day. And if you're going to keep a forward focus in life, a forward focus on Christ. You need to get rid of all the distractions. You need to forget what is behind. And you need to strain towards what is ahead. And then finally, dear friends, we need to press on towards the goal to win the prize. And we learn of that in verse 14. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me in heavenward in Christ Jesus. Passionate runners not only forget what lies behind but they also press on forward to what lies ahead. Their body set square, their center of gravity is low, their knees are properly bent, their arms swing in harmony with their legs, and their eyes are looking forward to the path in front of them. Everything about their posture reveals that their mindset is to run, to move forward, and make progress. The runner doesn't run by accident. The runner intends to run. The runner wakes up, puts on their running gear, they make sure they're hydrated, they stretch their muscles, they warm up, and then they run because they run, because they intend to run. And what is a Christian life about? It's about staying true to Christ. It is about staying true to the one who has redeemed us by his blood and claimed us as his own. It's about staying true to him and his purpose and his way. When Christ says, follow me, he means that you should follow him along the humble path of service and suffering, all the, way, all the way to glory. And he has promised he's going to be with us every step of the way. At every turn, at every steep hill, at every narrow pass, at every injury or moment or exhaustion, he has promised to be with you and strengthen you and lead you to the finishing line and then cross the finishing line into glory and rest and joy with him for eternity. We need to press on dear friends. So fellow Christian, let me ask you a question today. Do you intend to run? Maybe you're not a Christian today. Have you stepped up to the, the, to the starting line? Maybe today is the day you begin that race. Do you intend to make progress in your walk with Christ? Do you intend to advance in Christian maturity? Do you intend to become like Christ in his suffering and death so that afterwards you will become like Christ in his resurrection and his glory. Do you intend to pursue this glorious goal? Passionate runners just don't have a vague interest in running. 
They're earnest about it. They're devoted and serious about it. They're disciplined and they're regimented about it. They're training and they're preparing for it. They're eager and ready to run. And they run and keep on running until they finish the race. And God's will is that you will be that kind of runner too in your spiritual life, always keeping your eyes on the final goal of seeing your Savior face to face and living with him for all eternity. As we close, I want you to think of that film, Chariots of Fire, which you may have watched. It's a wonderful story telling the story of, of that other runner, uh, famous runner, Eric Lydell. He was called the Flying Scotsman. Not only was he a runner, but he was devoted to Christ. He served with the China Inland Mission. And he had many hardships and tragedies in his life as well. But he kept on running hard for Christ. He ended up in 1943 imprisoned in an internment camp where he cheerfully served those around him. And he died at the age of 43 in 1945 with a brain tumor, having been caused with mal malnourishment and overwork. And in Lydell's grave, it was marked by a simple wooden cross with his name written on it in boot polish. With this inscription, he died running. And I hope the same will be said of you and me. Amen. And we close our morning worship reflecting what we've been thinking about today with the words of our final hymn, Far Off I See the Goal.
doxology together. to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>